changed the world, but he's had a powerful impact not only in the church, but in the larger culture. Kenneth Samples is the uh, senior research scholar with a focus on theological and philosophical apologetics at Reasons to Believe, which provides research training on the harmony of God's revelation in the words of the Bible and the facts of nature. He's an adjunct instructor at Biola University. Samples also tackles tough faith questions with his books, Without a Doubt, answering the 20 toughest faith questions. I know that I and uh, Lindsey Brooks, uh, in our many years on the Apologetics.com team and the uh, radio show, always one of our favorite scholars to have come and teach us and come and speak to the audience was Ken Samples. He has uh, not only extraordinary erudition and uh, keen intellect, but uh, a, a marvelous capacity for expressing these things in the public square. Please welcome Ken Samples. Well, thank you very much. Um, I want to say just to start that the Apostle Paul had power and points, and I just have PowerPoint. So we'll be, we'll be reading and looking at your PowerPoint screen a little bit. I do want to thank uh, Chris and... Uh, Pastor Paul for inviting me. It's a wonderful pleasure to come and speak at a Bonson conference. I was a big fan of Greg Bonson. He had, uh, I didn't know him real well, but uh, he had a big influence on me. And many of his ideas have stayed with me over the years. So it's a real pleasure to hear David talk about his, uh, his father. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about understanding Greg Bonson, and I'll bet many, if most of the things I'm going to say you already know, but I'm also going to give you a little twist about uh, some of Greg's ideas that have influenced me, and I'm going to look at them from somewhat of a little bit of a different perspective. So let's begin by talking a little bit about Greg. You've already heard much of this. Uh, Greg lived only 47 years, like his son David. I can only wonder. Uh, what Dr. Bonson would have accomplished had he had more years. He was a philosopher, of course, uh, studying under Dallas Willard. What I thought was very interesting is that Dallas Willard really came from very much an Arminian theological point of view. But him and Greg got on really well. And I think that bodes well. I think God's people need to interact with each other. And uh, one thing I learned from Greg is that uh, love is maybe the most powerful apologetic of all, but I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Certainly, he was a theologian taking two master's degrees, as David mentioned, at Westminster Seminary, studying uh, under Dr. Van Til. Uh, an apologist of apologists is the way I would describe him, but an OPC minister, a teacher, uh, I think there are maybe more than 1,700 lectures by Dr. Bonson that are available uh, from Covenant Media. Of course, he was an author, and I first came across him as a debater. It was uh, the Gordon Stein debate that I saw, and I thought, wow, this guy is really different than all of the people I'd heard before. So he had a real influence on me from that point of view. Just a few of his books, uh, of course, his... Uh, analysis of Dr. Van Til, a great book, uh, engaging, presuppositional apologetics, very much a defender of presuppositional apologetic thinking. Uh, and of course, he's well known for defending theonomy. I would very much like to have uh, Dr. Bonson here today to talk to us a little bit about same-sex marriage and issues like that. I'm sure he'd have a lot of insight. Uh, God and Politics, Dr. Bonson participated in a number of those three or four people books. Here is God in Politics, so he was involved in that. Dr. Bonson, of course, defended a post-millennial point of view. Uh, not terribly popular in evangelical circles, but uh, I think a very powerful view of the eschaton. And uh, then a couple books that came out a little bit later, Always Ready, that uh, was uh, edited after his death, but a great book about apologetics. When I was working on a couple of my books, I was constantly looking at what Greg thought about the problem of evil and issues like that. And then The Standard Bearer that came out as a memorial to Dr. Bonson. So some of the books are uh, here and available, and one of the... One of the first tape series that, that I heard was uh, Greg's logic course. 
I've been teaching logic for 25 years. I love Greg's course. It is marvelous, insightful, uh, a master uh, teaching about the laws of logic, about uh, fallacious thinking and how to avoid it, critical thinking, very, very powerful in, in Greg's uh, teaching arsenal. And if, so, of course, to summarize a little bit here, he was a reformed theologian and an apologist, tenacious advocate of presuppositional apologetics, an advocate of theonomy and postmillennialism, but a term that he liked to use, and I think it's a powerful one, I saw him as a humble but bold servant of the Lord. And I want to talk just a little bit about uh, the first time I met Greg Bonson. Uh, I'm going to share here uh, four reflections about him. But let me mention a little bit about the first time I met him. Uh, I had uh, been trained in my Christian thinking by Walter Martin, who was the original Bible Answer Man, who was the president of the Christian Research Institute. And I worked there for seven years with Walter Martin. I was uh, the so-called Catholic and Seventh-day Adventist. I would say specialist, if that. Uh, but it was after Walter's death that I came to hear about Dr. Bonson. And I wanted to put together a book that would be a fair and careful evaluation of Roman Catholicism. And Dr. Bonson had debated a couple of Catholic theologians. I liked the debate. I thought it was clear and careful, uh, thoughtful and gracious. Uh, so I called him up. Uh, one of my friends told me that his favorite rock group was The Who, and I said, I've got to talk with that guy. Uh, when I met him, I was really surprised. I was expecting to meet uh, a erudite uh, philosopher. Whoops. How do I get back on this? Who's going to help out the, uh, the guy with few skills technologically? Well, let me keep talking, and we'll, uh, we'll hopefully get it back up and rolling. When I met Greg, he really took me by surprise. Uh, what I, the person I met was a pastor. And we talked for an hour, an hour, about our families. And I kind of asked him, Greg, do you have some advice for somebody who is uh, really hoping uh, to grow as a Christian apologist, uh, to continue my education? I asked him if he had any advice. And he said, you know, Ken, be very careful that you don't put so much time and attention into your academic studies that you neglect your, your incredibly important role as husband and father. And there have been times where, uh, quite frankly, uh, for those of us who are very cerebral, uh, I've probably read, uh, there have been many days I haven't done it, but most days I've had. Since I was 20 years old, I've tried to read three hours a day. But there have been times when I've read 1 Corinthians 13 and I thought, wow, I can barely get through that chapter thinking about uh, uh, my wife and my, my kids. But that's what Greg said to me. And I, I was surprised by it. I thought he would have some philosophical nugget or theological point. Uh, but he talked about family and the need to, uh, to devote yourself to your family and that maybe your, maybe your most important apologetic is going to be the character that you have. And so that was uh, something that really impressed me about uh, Dr. Bonson. Another thing that I want to talk just a little bit about, and I want to move pretty quickly to an apologetic idea that uh, he is well known for, and uh, certainly in the tradition of, of, of the Van Til camp, but his view of scripture. Uh, when, you look at, when you look at modern day Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, I think it's fair to say that the Catholic Church places the magisterial teaching office above scripture. I think the Eastern Orthodox position, if I can uh, be uh, fair, is I think that they put scripture and tradition side by side. But Greg, in his debates, had, I think, just a, a powerful way of presenting the truth of sola scriptura. How do we derive the principle of sola scriptura? How does scripture relate to uh, various other issues? And so that was a very uh, powerful thing. One more thing. Um, like all of you, I'm sure, I was deeply impressed with uh, Greg's life of the mind to the glory of God. Uh, th there are, unfortunately, too many theological traditions that have far too much anti-intellectualism in them. And I have been in churches where 
to be a scholar, to be interested in the life of the mind, you don't feel like there's a place for you. But uh, Greg had this incredible uh, love of knowledge, uh, this incredible ability to convey what he believed and why he believed it. Uh, and so that was something that uh, very much uh, attracted me to him. I want to talk a, a little bit more uh, about the transcendental argument, but I'm going to see if Chris can kind of help us get there, and if not, we'll take it as far as we can. Uh, let me take a drink of water here. So we've looked at a few of these, uh, his, his family. Uh, we talked a little bit about the life of the mind, the glory of God. Uh, powerful view of, of Holy Scripture. But the, remember the first time I heard the transcendental proof, as he called it, of God's existence. It was in the Gordon Stein debate. And uh, the interesting thing is that the University of California, Irvine, has for many years done the great debate. And the Bonson-Stein debate was in 1985. I did that debate in 1990. I remember debating uh, Stephen Thorne, who was the head of the Atheist Society in San Diego. So that was a, uh, a very important part of what uh, was happening at the University of California at Irvine. And I want to read a little bit from Dr. Bonson. I think it's important to hear his words. And I remember the first time that I heard this debate, uh, and how excited I was about it, because I thought that, uh, again, Dr. Bonson had a great way of doing apologetics and opening the door to evangelism. Well, here's Greg, and these words are, are so uh, popular in my ears as I read them again. He says in a debate with Dr. Stein, when we go to look at the different worldviews that atheists and theists have, I suggest we can prove the existence of God from the impossibility of the contrary. The transcendental proof for God's existence is that without him, it is impossible to prove anything. He continues, the atheist worldview is irrational and cannot consistently provide the preconditions of intelligible experience, science, logic, morality. The atheist worldview cannot allow for laws of logic, the uniformity of nature, the ability for the mind to understand the world, and moral absolutes. In that sense, the atheist worldview cannot account for our debate tonight. He continues, this is in his closing statement, Dr. Bonson said, notice the argument doesn't say that atheists don't prove things or that they don't use logic, science, or laws of morality. In fact, they do. The argument is that their worldview cannot account for what they are doing. Their worldview is not consistent with what they are doing. And then he says, in their worldview, that naturalistic, atheistic worldview, uh, there are no laws. There are no abstract entities, universals, or prescriptions. There's just a material universe, naturalistically explained as the way things happen to be. That's not law-like or universal, and therefore their worldview doesn't account for logic, science, or morality. I was very pleased to see that this recent book, I think it's published in uh, 2012, which is an anthology of uh, uh, all kinds of primary sources in apologetics, I was, I was wondering whether they would include something on presuppositional apologetics. And they have the entire uh, Bonson-Stein debate in there. And I reread it, and again, it reminded me of some of the ideas that I had learned at uh, at a younger stage. I think whenever your image appears on a t-shirt, you probably have reached the place of legend. <laughs> I'm not sure what Greg would think about that, quite frankly, that there are people with uh, his image on their t-shirt. I know he'd like that no neutrality idea, though. That would be something that he would like. Well, what I would like to do with you for the rest of my time is I want to take this idea of the preconditions of intelligible experience which I think is a very powerful way of reasoning. I want to show you how that, that this still goes on. Uh, it may not be in a direct presuppositional context, but there are people still taking this idea of how do we explain the preconditions of experience. Transcendental arguments go back at least to Kant. 
And I think it continues in philosophy and science, and I want to do a little bit of illustrating that for you. As I do, let's ask two questions. Are big picture belief systems or worldviews, like fighters in boxing, are they vulnerable to a knockout blows? I think they are, and I think Dr. Bonson certainly believed that, that there are worldviews that can be knocked out. Another question, can certain issues or problems prove so intractable that they render a worldview unviable as a belief system? I think so. I think naturalism is facing many intractable problems when it comes to explaining the nature of reality. And I'm talking about things like the origin of life, how difficult it is. Uh, I work with a number of science scholars uh, who have gone to some of the leading uh, origin of life conferences, uh, both in America and outside the United States. And some of the leading people in their most candid moments, in fact, they will say, I hope there's no creationists in here when I say this, but uh, we are depressed about any explanation about the origin of, of life. And I think that extends to consciousness. I think it extends uh, to many other areas in which the naturalist worldview does not have an adequate explanation about these kinds of realities that are so critical. Well, let me, let me cover a few of these ideas and maybe interrelate them with what Dr. Bonson might think. In his most recent book, Mind and Cosmos, you need to put this on your bookshelf if you haven't, eminent secular philosopher uh, Thomas Nagel concludes that Darwinian materialism has failed as a comprehensive scientific explanation for reality. Now, some of you have a background in philosophy, and you know that Thomas Nagel is a big name. New York University, uh, he is a philosopher of mind. Uh, he's an interesting person. He's a good friend with Alvin Plantica. And one of the points that Nagel has made kind of offhanded is it troubles him that so many of his friends believe in God. So many of his most intelligent friends believe in God. This book is a very candid volume. And I just want to quote uh, a few things from Tom Nagel. He says, quote, consciousness explaining human consciousness. Consciousness is the most conspicuous obstacle to a comprehensive naturalism that relies only on the resources of physical science. How do we explain consciousness? I think it's fair to say that some of the leading philosophers in this area are also quite pessimistic. Can, can we produce uh, a reductionist system? Uh, that hasn't worked terribly well for them. Uh, other, other ways of thinking about it, they're quite pessimistic. Nagel, of course, who is an ardent atheist and has no predilection toward theism, he says this, quote, on a purely materialist understanding of biology, consciousness would have to be regarded as a tremendous and inexplicable extra brute fact about the world. He then says it is an assumption, he's thinking here now, of naturalistic uh, Darwinian evolution. It is an assumption governing the scientific project rather than a well-confirmed scientific hypothesis. That's a real jab at naturalism being able to explain these preconditions for life and thought. And then finally, Nagel says this. He says about Darwinian naturalism, I realize that such doubts about Darwinian naturalism will strike many people as outrageous. But that is because almost everyone in our secular culture has been browbeaten into regarding reductive research program as sacrosanct on the ground that anything else would not be science. Well, I think that that's exactly what Dr. Bonson was getting at. What worldview can, can explain the necessary preconditions, logic, morality, our ability to uh, use mathematical systems to understand the world? Uh, I mentioned that Nagel is a close friend with uh, Al Plantica. I remember asking Greg Bonson one day um, what he thought of Alvin Plantica. He said, well, I don't always agree with him, but he said he's a genius. Uh, Many people, of course, would return the favor to Dr. Bonson. Here's what Al Plantica says 
uh, who is, again, a close friend with Tom Nagel. He says, materialist naturalism, says Nagel, cannot account for the appearance of life or the variety we find in the living world or consciousness or cognition or mind, but theism has no problem accounting for any of these things. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Plantica and C.S. Lewis and others would talk about as the argument from reason. And it may not be exactly what uh, the transcendental argument is touching on, but they cover a lot of similar ground. Naturalism is an inadequate worldview to explain the preconditions of life, including consciousness, logic, and things of that nature. Uh, and how do we explain reason? Here is uh, a couple people. Uh, Lewis, who uh, presented in Miracles a, a case for the argument from reason. And I really like what the Catholic philosopher Richard Pertill does with that argument for reason. Here's Pertill in his uh, C.S. Lewis case for the Christian faith. Again, thinking of the idea, how do we explain reason? How can you have conscious beings that reason if there is no God? Um, Pertil says, one way of getting a preliminary insight into C.S. Lewis's argument from reason is to ask whether nature is the product of mind or mind is the product of nature. If God created nature, as Christians believe, then nature is understandable by reason because it is the product of reason. Now, let's, let's sort that out there a little bit. The question is, is nature the product of mind or is mind the product of nature? The Christian worldview would say that nature is the product of mind, the product of God's mind. God's creative powers brought the universe into existence, and so nature was brought forth by a mind. We move from mind to nature. A, an, an infinite, eternal mind made nature. But look at the naturalist position. They would say that mind is the product of nature, and so nature produced mind. Nature made mind. That is a very powerful way of kind of thinking about some of these things that Greg was talking about in the transcendental argument. Now, another element of this is how do we, how do we explain that the world is intelligible, at least largely intelligible to us? How is it that human beings have the capacity to understand so much about the nature of reality? I remember being a, a senior at Concordia University here in Irvine, uh, getting a degree, and my counselor said, you need to take a hard science to graduate. I said, well, they're all hard for me. But I remember taking physics, and about halfway through, I was a straight A student, and about halfway through the course, I was getting a C plus, and I thought, what's going on? Why is physics? Uh, so difficult for me. And I came to the conclusion that my mathematics preparation was not adequate. Physicists look at the world through the prism of mathematics. But there was something that I was good at thinking about. And that was, why would mathematical concepts, why would a conceptual theory such as Albert Einstein, why would that correspond to the nature of reality? That makes perfect sense in a Christian worldview that mind produced nature, that mathematics flow from the nature of God, that human beings are made in God's image, and they're able to utilize mathematics and understanding. There is this continuity, this connection between the two. Well, again, Christianity, uh, nature is expectedly understandable by reason, by science, because it's the product of reason. Of course we should be able to do science because we expect that a cosmic mind made nature. And being made in the image of God, we can track, not completely, not exhaustively, but we can study, we can understand. Natural is, again, very different. Uh, the cosmos is unexpectedly, understandably by reason. So, there are many naturalists, and I'm going to quote uh, a leading cosmologist in just a few minutes, uh, that look at the universe and say, one of the most puzzling things about the universe is that it's intelligible, and that human beings are so endowed that they're able to do that. So nature is unexpectedly 
understandably by reason science because it is the product of reason. It's not the product of reason. Now, let me introduce you to Dr. Uh, Paul Davies. Uh, I really like Dr. Davies. Uh, he's a little frustrating because he comes very close to uh, embracing the ideas of a Christian worldview, but, but quickly stops very short. In fact, I was listening to a podcast interview in which he said, uh, yeah, the other day I was reading St. Augustine, and I almost hit the car in front of me when he said that. <laughs> I thought, what is a leading physicist and cosmologist who I know is at least an agnostic, what in the world is he doing reading St. Augustine? Well, here we go again. Um, maybe, maybe the problem is I'm not keeping it going fast enough. Uh, it's back, or no, it's not. Well, let me talk a little bit about uh, this uh, idea. Uh, I want to read a quote from Paul Davies, and I want you to listen to this very carefully. Uh, he says this, this is in the Templeton Address. So Davies has uh, received the Templeton Award for his work in the area of science and by implication, I guess, even faith. He says this, in the ensuing 300 years, the theological dimension of science has faded. People take it for granted that the physical world is both ordered and intelligible. The underlying order in nature, the laws of physics, are simply accepted as given as brute facts. Nobody asks where they came from. At least they do not do so in polite company. Uh, let me finish this quote, and then we'll get Chris to rescue us for a second time. Uh, Davies continues, however, even the most atheistic scientist accepts as an act of faith that the universe is not absurd that there is a rational basis to physical existence manifested as law-like order in nature that is at least part comprehensible to us. And here's the statement. So science can proceed only if the scientist adopts an essentially theological worldview. Very powerful statement. Let's see if Chris can work us back there. Again, um, this question of the preconditions, how do we explain logic? Why are people, why, why are human beings able to do science? Uh, all of these questions about uh, how we understand them, uh, I think go back to that initial argument that I heard from Dr. Bonson. It hooked me. And I've never been able to let go of that idea. Uh, I think if I offered any criticism uh, about the transcendental argument, I'd like to hear more of the argument. I agree with Greg that uh, naturalism cannot explain many things, but I think that sometimes it's more of a proclamation than it is really getting down and arguing some of those uh, particular areas. So that would be one of the criticisms that I might have. But uh, I think Greg did that maybe in other places, or certainly he intended to do that. Let's see how we're doing over here. Wonderful quote, again, so science can only proceed if the scientist adopts an essentially theological worldview. Well, here's another philosopher, Greg Ganzel, and he talks again about this expected congruence between the Christian worldview uh, and the nature of reality. He says uh, in an article entitled Dawkins' Best Argument uh, Against God's Existence, uh, the fact that the universe is made by a mind for reason leads us to expect that it can be grasped rationally. It makes sense that stable laws would allow predictions to be made and inferences to be drawn. Uh, again, the idea that the Christian worldview, that science was birthed in a Christian worldview, makes a great deal of sense. And Ganzel says this, a naturalist universe, however, would not have to be susceptible to rational investigation. It fits perfectly well with a naturalistic universe that is wildly chaotic. Of course, being susceptible to rational investigation is not incompatible with a universe without God. Greg Bonson may strongly differ there. But the theory that God does not exist allows the universe to exhibit any one of a wide variety of descriptions as far as order is concerned. So this argument may be taking a different form. Uh, again, the argument from reason may not be exactly the transcendental argument, but they cover a lot of philosophical ground, similar philosophical ground. Lewis made the argument from reason in his book, Miracles. Richard Pertill uh, 
uh, I think uh, helps us to understand a difficult argument in the argument from reason in his book, C.S. Lewis, The Case for the Christian Faith. Well, let me, uh, let me move toward a close by again quoting Paul Davies. This, is, uh, this was an article that he wrote in the New York Times. And notice again what he says about the nature of the physical universe. He says, quote, over the years I have often asked physicist colleagues why the laws of physics are what they are. The answers vary from that's not a scientific question to nobody knows. The favorite reply is there is no reason. They are what they are. They just are. Then he says this, the idea that the laws exist reasonlessly, that immediately made me think of Greg Bonson. That the universe would exist reasonlessly. The idea that the laws exist reasonlessly is deeply anti-rational. After all, the very essence of a scientific explanation of some phenomenon is that the world is ordered logically and that there are reasons things are as they are. If one traces these reasons all the way down to the bedrock of reality, the laws of physics, only to find that the reason that reason then deserts us, it makes a mockery of science. I think that uh, this argument continues. Uh, let me read just a little bit from Dr. Bonson. This is his closing statement about uh, the transcendental argument. He says, from a transcendental standpoint, the atheist view cannot account for this debate tonight because this debate is assumed that we're going to use the laws of logic as standards of reasoning or else we're irrational, that we're going to use the laws of science, that we're going to assume induction and causation and all those things that scientists do. He then closes his debate with Dr. Stein by saying this, therefore I feel justified concluding as I did in my opening presentation this evening by saying that the proof of the Christian God is in the impossibility of, is in the impossibility of the contrary. Without the Christian worldview, this debate wouldn't make sense. Well, I knew Greg just a little bit. And uh, I, remember, I remember the day that he died. A colleague called me at, late at night and told me that Dr. Bonson had died. And uh, I sure made sure that I went to his funeral. And I'll tell you, the thing that Greg left with me, Dr. Bonson, uh, is he was always trying to make sense of sense. And I think what we see in other areas of apologetics, uh, naturalistic evolution, the naturalist worldview is still vulnerable. And all of us are trying to make sense of these preconditions of life. I try to write a little bit about that in my book. Uh, I'm not a, a technical presuppositionalist. I might differ on a point or two, but I sure appreciate the scholarship that stands in that tradition. And uh, that idea of explaining the preconditions remains something that's important to me. If you want to understand Greg Bonson, read Greg Bonson. If you want to understand Greg Bonson, listen to tapes about him and by him. How many of you have read a book or listened to a tape or heard Greg in person? Yeah, I mean, just look around at the room. Greg had a powerful impact. And his impact wasn't just in the presuppositional camp. His impact was broader than that. And I'll never forget meeting him and thinking to myself, wow, I'm, it, this is a lot like talking to my pastor rather than talking to uh, somebody who is an erudite philosopher or apologist. Well, I'm going to end there, and I'm hoping uh, that we have a few minutes where maybe we can, we can take a few questions. Though there may be questions about Greg that some of you know more than I do, but I'll do my best. Hi. <clears throat> hey, last night at the debate, uh, and I hear this from atheists quite a bit, that uh, the laws of logic are nothing but human convention. I was just curious on how you would describe what the laws of logic are and defend uh, that. Yeah, you know, one thing, having just read the Bonson-Stein debate a couple times, uh, there is a lot of discussion in that debate about that very issue 
That's the position that Dr. Stein takes, that they're mere conventions and uh, that we kind of settle on these particular ideas. Well, there, there are lots of, uh, lots of things we can say about these conceptual realities. I think the standard Christian position, however, is that, that the, the laws of logic flow from the mind of God. That's kind of the standby position that many take. There, there are other metaphysicians who carve it out in a little bit of a different way. But I would say that these are not invented conceptual ideas. Uh, certainly Einstein didn't invent mathematics. Uh, I've talked to many mathematicians, who, and they readily admit and accept the idea that mathematics are not invented, they're discovered. I think the laws of logic are not invented by any stretch of the imagination, they're discovered. How do we account for them? And again, if there's no God and we're the product of blind mechanistic natural processes, I mean, a very strong point about the argument from reason is evolution and human rationality don't fit. That is, evolution goes against naturalism. Rather than being a vehicle of it, uh, we go from a non-mind to a mind. And today I hear, I hear unusual things said. Um, some of the naturalists, Lawrence Krauss, uh, the famous physicist, Dr. Krauss would say things like, the reason you believe in God, the reason you believe uh, in a in a cosmic father figure, the reason you believe in life after death, and all of these kinds of things is that these things had survival advantages. Well, I love it when they say that because I say, oh, well then naturalistic evolution has put false beliefs in our minds? How can we trust it? So I think the further we go in this area, the more naturalism seems to have real trouble explaining anything like the laws of logic and morality. But I'm not surprised that you heard that similar reasoning, because you're going to hear it again and again. That's kind of the standard naturalistic, atheistic explanation. Uh, Dr. Samples, thank you. Um, I'm going to try to frame this question. Hopefully, it'll be understandable. But I noticed in last night's debate um, that well, it was pointed out by the atheist side that I think Sai has a website that said proof that God exists, and he's not actually providing proof. So, along lines of presuppositional thinking, do you think what Bonson has offered here is not really a proof, but he's kind of playing on the word? It's really, really an acknowledgement of God's existence versus not acknowledging it and what the implications of, of that are. Like, for instance, if you look at the Bible, if there was a place to prove God would be there, but the Bible just starts talking about him as if you should know. So is it, would you agree that it's really an issue of acknowledgement of his existence and, and, and what pans out from that? Yeah, um, great question. Um, if I were to... Uh maybe pigeonhole myself in terms of apologetic methodology. Uh, though I've learned much from Greg Bonson, and, and, uh, and I know Dr. Frame as well, and I appreciate, I'm a reformed Christian. I've got to appreciate that, those kinds of individuals. If I were to put myself into an apologetic methodology, which, by the way, I think we probably spend far too much time debating our, our apologetic methodologies instead of doing apologetics, if you don't mind me saying that, um, I would say that I think that the Christian worldview provides the best explanation of all of these profound realities. I like kind of a cumulative case. I like the abductive approach there. And I think there's, there's overlap. I mean, even in the five views of apologetic books, uh, at the end of all of this discussion, I liked it that the Christians came together and said, we can agree. So in answering your question, I think when it comes to intractable problems, I mean, naturalists are very quick to say, yeah, but you're you're reasoning God of the gaps. Give us a little more time and we'll explain all of these things. Well, um, I'd say a couple things. You don't uh, reason in the future, you reason now. You can't say, well, you know, give us more time and in the future we'll come up with an explanation of, of that. Uh, that's a fallacious form of reasoning, appeal to the future. 
But I would say this, that I think that uh, in many of these areas, the naturalists are very pessimistic. And I think the Christian worldview does a very good job of explaining logic and moral, objective morality, but also the origin of the universe. Um, I know that some Christians are troubled by the Big Bang. I would only tell you there are a lot of atheists that are troubled by the Big Bang, that there's a singular beginning to the universe. So it could be, um, I don't know what to think of that word proof, but I would say this, that I think Greg is, is touching, and I think uh, my presuppositional friends and colleagues have done a, a great job of saying, look, you need some ground of explanation for these things. And I think that uh, Dr. Stein was waiting for the traditional presentation, and uh, he didn't know what hit him. Uh, he didn't figure out the transcendental argument probably until much later. It's interesting to me, too, that uh, both uh, Dr. Bonson and Dr. Stein died prematurely. I, I wonder what Dr. Stein thought uh, about some of these issues that went back and forth. Thank you very much, Mr. Samples. We appreciate your time. Thank you.